Welcome back to Pray TV. We are glad that you have made the willingness, the effort to be able to click on that button and allow us to be a part of your day. We are undergirding prayer and intercession here on this program. And I have a friend, and he's an old friend, <laughs> and his name is Jeff Steinberg. Jeff, you're welcome to the program. Thank you for being you here. You just had to get that old part in, didn't you? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> well, truth be told, you're two years older than I am. Ooh. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I did not know when I came to New England this time that I would have the privilege of being on television with my very longtime friend. Brant Gillespie, and he's he's one of my heroes. Uh, we'll talk about that. Well, <laughs> we need to go elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> the, the moment I become a hero is, you know, we're too far gone on the program. But anyway, we will talk about many other things, and we will be having other parts where we go into discussion. But as you know, our program is really about prayer, undergirding intercession and prayer. And so we're going to read a verse of scripture here that is very meaningful to Jeff, and I'm going to have him make a comment on it. It's Psalm 46 and verse 10. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Jeff, why is that so meaningful to you? About 10 years ago, I... Uh... I kind of screwed up. Now, you don't hear very many people who are, you know, performers or speakers or whatever talk about the times they've messed up. But the truth is, this wasn't just a tiny little thing. This was pretty big. And I was getting ready to perform at an event for a Saturday evening in New York State, and I was going to speak the next day. And, uh, all of a sudden, my wife sent me a text right at the beginning of the time when I thought I could actually do that sort of thing. And, and all it said was Psalm 4610. So I grabbed a Bible, got somebody to get me one, and I, I read it. And the only words I saw was, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. And it was like the Lord had just wrapped his arms around me and said, I've got a message for you. And I knew that the next morning I was supposed to sing and speak at a church nearby. And just as clear as I hear you, I heard his voice say, I want you to talk about this tomorrow. And I said, but Lord, I haven't even prepared anything. He said, you show up and I'll be there waiting for you and I'll tell you what to say. And that was the message that I gave. And that message is still true today. Be still and know, I am God, and I will be exalted. Jeff, we're going to read this one more time, and then we're going to ask you to begin our prayer, which I will follow on. He says, Be still and know that I am God, I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted in the earth. Jeff, you lead us in prayer. Father, you are God. You are the God who made us. You are the God who forgives us. You are the God who heals us. You are the God who calls us. You are the God who equips us. You be exalted in our lives. In the, in the earth, in the world, in the world of politics, in the world of entertainment, in the world of plumbing and schools and social organizations. You be the God of all of this and you be exalted in our lives. Whatever it is we're facing today, we, we, we always seem to forget we, we, we look at the times when we've messed up and we think, there's no way back. And yet you are God and you have made a way back for us. And we can not only know who we are and that you created us, but we can also know that you forgive us and we can forgive ourselves. 
that you heal us and we can allow that healing to flow through us. That you call us. Who would have ever dreamed that you would have called a, a, a little man with no arms and malformed mangled legs and yet you gave me everything I need to do what it is you called me to do and to be good at it. Be exalted in our lives. Mm. In your name. And Father, we are grateful that you have really worked miracles in all of our lives. And all we have to do is just look a little bit inside and we can see your handiwork. We can observe how kind, how good, how faithful you have been to each one of us. And Lord, we just know that as you are going to unfold some of Jeff's story here in this next segment, that Lord, there are going to be people who are going to be richly blessed and ministered to by it. Thank you, Lord. You are at work and we praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Remember, keep praying, folks. This is not the end of your prayer time. We, we're just here to encourage you, and we believe the Word of God where it says, be instant in prayer, praying always, pray without ceasing. But, you know, we're going to take a few moments now, and we're just going to get Jeff to tell us a little bit of his story. And I know a bit of it, quite a bit of it, actually, but uh, I want him to tell it in his words. So, Jeff, maybe you'd just open up your heart and share with our folk what God has done in your life and how it all began. And, and is so there's something that's special there. Remember, we're going to be here for three days with Jeff. And so you're going to hear more of this unfold. But we'll, we'll take a, a first crack at it right here. Okay, thanks, Jeff. I was born August 18, 1951 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with what the doctors called phocomycelia birth defects. Kind of an ugly word when you talk about a baby. And yet I have no arms, mangled, malformed legs. The doctors didn't expect that I was going to live. My dad saw me and decided that my mom should not be told about my disability. She didn't learn about my disability till I was almost 17 months old. And she didn't see me for the first time until I was almost two years old in a children's welfare shelter in Philadelphia. My dad, my mom, my oldest sister Linda all came to visit. My mom picked me up and she held me in her arms and she paced the floor with me in her arms back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then she placed me back where she found me, turned to my father and his tall as her four foot eight frame would hold her. She looked at him and she said, Irving, take me home. I'm ready to leave now. It would be many years later and many tears later before we would come together and she would look me in the eye and she would tell me, Jeffrey, I did not nurse you. I did not raise you. I didn't even know how to love you. Wow, that'll make your day. And you thought you had problems. <laughs> <laughs> My mother told me she didn't know how to love me. When I was two and a half years old, I was placed into the care of the Shriners Hospital for Crippled Children. They operated on my legs to straighten them. They discovered there was no joint in my right knee. They broke the bones. They fused my leg back together stiff. They cleaned away valuable growth tissue. And I'll always be four feet, six inches tall. Michael Jordan, eat your heart out. I learned to do all kinds of things with my feet. I learned to write with my feet. Can you write with your feet? Can you, Brent? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I used to suck my big toe. Ooh. I even learned to feed myself with my feet. Can you feed yourself with your feet, Brent? I am afraid I don't have that skill mastered. <laughs> Can you get your feet to your mouth? 
I probably could have when I was young, but no, no longer. Oh, I don't know. I was told you were pretty good at putting your feet in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a true statement for sure. I've been waiting for an opportunity like that. <laughs> I uh, lived in and out of Shriners Hospital for five and a half years, some 25, 35 plus operations. And one day the doctors came on their weekly rounds and they said, Jeffrey, we're going to send you home. We can't do anything more with you till you stop growing. So I looked at the doctor and said, well, give it a week. And I got to go home. I got to live at home for a total of nine months. But it got to be too hard for my mom and dad to take care of me and three girls. It was the girls that were the problem. <laughs> it's always the girls that are the problem. So I was placed into the care of a foster family that had a daughter that had cerebral palsy and I was with them for about eight weeks and then finally one day my foster mom came and she said Jeff they're gonna your mom and dad are coming to take you home or to take you somewhere else we gotta get you packed I thought I was going home I was delirious I was excited but instead on Halloween day 1960, we drove 63 miles away to the Good Shepherd home for kids with disabilities and old people. I remember my dad carrying me up the steps, 10 steps in front of that building, and I sat in that plush leather chair sliding out of it. And I remembered the superintendent and my dad talking about me as if I wasn't even in the room and that, like I didn't understand. But the truth is, don't feel sorry for me. Don't you dare. Because I was an 11-year-old boy in a home for kids with disabilities and old people. And because of the love of a local Christian couple, this little Jewish boy from Philadelphia with an attitude gave my life to Jesus. And I became a masterpiece in progress. And I learned that I, Jeffrey David Steinberg, am fearfully and wonderfully made. God makes no mistakes. God makes no junk. Amen. And I gave, and, and from that point on, I went to public high school, I graduated from public high school with a class of 771. I went a year to Bible college in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I started a singing group called the Total Victory Trio. There were five of us in the group. Obviously, math was not our strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day I got a chance to attend a concert in Souderton, Pennsylvania. And four guys that called themselves the Eastman Quartet. And I was, I was captured and captivated from that point on. I knew that I wanted to be on that side of the stage. Hmm. The next morning they were at a local church in New Jersey and I asked if they would do He Touched Me. That's the only song I knew besides How Great Thou Art. J.R. got up and announced to the crowd that somebody had asked for He Touched Me and he knew who it was. He said, I apologize, but it's too early in the morning and Ron can't quite hit those notes this early. And Ron said, what do you mean I can't hit those notes? And he said, who, 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 who requested it? And I raised my hook in the air and he said, he took one look at me and he said, I'll do it. And he sang, he touched me for me. Hmm. A few months later, I got a chance to go hear the Eastman at a concert with a group called the Envoys. I didn't know that a couple of months later that I would uh, be at Good Shepherd when you guys came to visit a boy who had been in a motorcycle accident. And we went down to the auditorium later that after that visit, 
and you sang some songs right. sitting at the piano. Right. And that was my first contact with you, Brain. Mm -hmm. And you and your friends made an indelible mark in my life. Of course, Don did everything he could. Every time he'd offer me an opportunity to go on stage, he'd do everything he could to get me off stage as quickly as possible. <laughs> well, you have a way of taking over a stage. I'll, I'll just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. But the truth is, I owe an awful lot to, to guys like you. Mm. And being able to give it back, I had no idea that at the time that I would take a different turn down the road. I still sing, but I'm more of the clown that I used to be and do humor. I mean, after all, I drive Uber and Lyft. I had a guy, a businessman, got in my car and he saw the hook on the wheel and he looks at my hook and he says, were you born like that? I said, without the hook, so that would really leave a mark. Yeah, that would be tough on the mother. <laughs> I said, my mom would not be happy. <laughs> I had a five-year-old that pointed to my hook and he wanted to know why I didn't have any hands. I told him I used to bite my fingernails and one day I went too far. <laughs> He's in trauma therapy now. <laughs> yeah, I bet he is. Listen, Jeff, I, you are going to uh, share with the folk uh, something of a song, and I'd like you to tell them a bit of the background of that before we go to that song. Would you do that? My best friend's name is Jeff Rudloff. He was my tenor singer and my piano player in both of the singing groups that I was in, uh, the Total Victory Trio, and later on in a group called Jeff Steinberg with Wind and Fire. And I, he and I had gone to California after the groups had broken up and we did an event back in 1983 at a Baptist church in California in Van Nuys. And I said to the audience, each of us is a masterpiece, becoming one color at a time, all that God designed for us to be. Sometimes the colors blend and sometimes they stand in sharp contrast up against each other, the light and the dark, the harsh and the smooth. We got home that weekend. We flew home on Monday. And Monday night he called me. He said, I got the title to your next album. Now, Jeff never tells me what the song is. He says, I got this song. Maybe I'll tell you the title, but I'm not telling you the rest of it. He said, you want to hear some of the lyrics? I said, yeah, <laughs> you think? He says, when an artist starts painting on a blank piece of canvas, it doesn't always look very good. You're wondering what it's going to be like when it's done, if it's ever going to look like it should. When the colors start blending and shapes begin forming, you begin to see the master design. When the last stroke is painted and the brush is laid down, it's exactly what he had in mind. I'm a masterpiece in progress. He is still working on me. I'm a masterpiece in progress. I'm becoming all he designed for me to be. I'm a masterpiece in progress and it won't be too long till it's done. A few more strokes of the brush and the master's touch and I'll be in the image of the sun. That became the title song of my album called Masterpiece in Progress. And this is the video. I'm gonna just roll that video. And when we do, we're just gonna close out our program with that. But remember this, we're gonna be back tomorrow and the next day as well. And so you just watch this and let it speak to your soul and cause your heart to engage because we are all under the master's hand, becoming that masterpiece of his creation. Watch it. When a 
an artist starts painting on a blank piece of canvas Doesn't always look very good You're Wondering what it's gonna be like when it's done If it's ever gonna look like it should When the colors start blending, shapes begin forming You begin to see the master design when the last stroke is painted and the brush is laid down It's exactly what he had in mind I'm a masterpiece in progress He is still working on me I may not look like it yet You better bet I'm becoming all he wants me to be I'm a masterpiece in progress won't be too long till I'm done A few more strokes of the brush And the master's touch I'll be in the image of the sun When you look at me You'll see a half-finished picture Pieces of what I'm gonna be God is still working real hard in my life Painting things that only he can see sometimes the colors are bright ones sometimes they're dark ones they're all a part of what he has planned he'll complete what he started in his own perfect time if i submit to the brush in his hand i'm a masterpiece in progress he is to work and on me i may not look like it yet you better bet I'm becoming all he wants me to be I'm a masterpiece in progress now Won't be too long till I'm done A few more strokes of the brush and the master's touch I'll be in the image of the sun I'm a masterpiece in progress Jesus is working on me I may not look like it yet You better bet I'm becoming all he wants me to be I'm a masterpiece in progress Won't be too long till I'm done A few more strokes of the brush And the master's touch I'll be the image of the sun. The sun. The sun. You're a masterpiece. And you're a masterpiece. And you, and you're a masterpiece, and me, I'm a masterpiece, yeah.